We've been doing a series, and I believe this could be the final message in it, on how to live a meaningful life. And it's on the proposition that one of the most culturally radical things you can do in our modern day society is get fully engaged in a local church. And we've been exploring in different ways what that actually means. And it's as Jesus' disciples that we're better together. We're better when we're caring for each other, loving each other, praying for each other, uh, bringing encouragement and support in whatever way we can. As we all committed to the purpose of God in and through our lives and through others, it's not just the purpose in our lives, it's what's going on in others and then the life of the church and then beyond it, the greater church. And so I wanna pose the question this morning on how can we help each other grow? Because throughout the New Testament, there's, there's incredible exhortations from the Apostle Paul to grow up into Christ. And it's not a solo thing that you're meant to do. Yeah, you've got to take responsibility for certain things in your own life, like praying, reading your Bible, turning up to church, engaging in the online campus, whatever it is. But then there's other things that we actually need each other to be doing. You doing it for somebody, somebody doing it for you that helps you grow in Christ. Because we really do need each other. That's one of the powerful messages out of the New Testament. Paul, using the analogy of a human body, says this in 1 Corinthians 12, 19 to 20, and he's comparing it to the body of Christ, the church. He says, how strange a body would be if it only had one part. And you can see he's almost appealing to the ridiculous. What if the whole body was just one big eye? An ear, maybe in some instances, a tongue. I'm going to leave that one alone because I could get in a lot of trouble there. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And he's making this powerful statement that as the body of Christ, we need each other. And our spiritual growth and our spiritual health is tied to how connected we are to others. If you were to go outside and pick a tree, cut a branch of it, I'm talking about a younger tree that's growing, cut a branch off it, you and I know what would happen. The tree would continue to grow towards maturity. The branch initially, while looking still alive, within a day or so, is going to be, show signs of death because it's no longer connected to the tree. And it's the same thing when people try to do Christianity, following Jesus all by themselves. And I know we've had a lot of things happen in these last few years that have forced us into isolation and different things and maybe being a little more disconnected. But we've managed to bridge that through our online campus, through other things. But it's got to be more than just that. Growth depends on connection. Paul says in Romans 12 and verse four to five, just as our bodies have many parts and each has a special function. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we belong to each other. You can turn to the person next to you and say, you belong to me. A little bit of pigeon English. Ricky will tell me how good or bad that was after the service. Just be gentle. Then again, in Colossians 2, and I want to notice, we're reading from Romans, Corinthians, Colossians. This is a constant theme with the Apostle Paul. Colossians 2, verse 19. He says, the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. He says, in the connection, in the linking together, God produces growth. And so again, I pose the question, how do we help each other grow? And if we really 
believe what Paul has been saying in these passages, that should be a question that's at the forefront of our minds. In terms of the people that I know who follow Jesus, what can I contribute, invest in their lives that will help them grow? And what can I receive from them that will help me grow? Not just trying to do it all in isolation. How can God use me to help other people grow? In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, he says, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Encourage one another, build each other up. And then he commends the church of Thessalonica. He says, you're doing it, but I'm just kind of reminding you because this is important. And there's a whole list. In fact, I had to cut out whole chunks of points. I had more points than a porcupine. And you'll be thankful that I've reduced it to three. But how do we encourage each other to grow? And there's others we can add to the list, but I think these three kind of anchor most things. The, The first is by affirming each other's worth, value. As someone who is in Christ. In fact, even, and I don't mean this in a lesser sense, that their humanity created by God, placed on the planet in history at this point in time. And we all need affirmation. People do extraordinary things just to want to belong to a group. They'll do criminal things sometimes, foolish things, because it allows them to belong and to be affirmed in some way. I'm not recommending that, not even at youth. Danny, Scar. (laughs) There's some good things going on in youth. So the first thing that we do to affirm one another is we do it with acceptance. In Romans 15 and verse 7, where Paul is getting really practical after going through a whole lot of incredible theology and understanding about the significance of what Christ has done for us. He says, now you've got to work this out. And he says, accept one another then. Just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise or glory to God. Accept one another. The the Greek word there can also be translated welcome or receive. Accept is accurate. So it's set by welcoming and receiving people, you affirm their worth. We think our world is divided today politically, all sorts of things, and it is. Uh, I don't know about you, at times it grieves my heart just to see how human beings on the planet, so called in an enlightened age, still treat each other. But the ancient world was as divided and as polarised around religion, race, male, female, all sorts of things as our modern society is. And in Jesus' name, his disciples simply transcended the hatred. One of the emperors who hated Christians remarked on how they love each other. It stood out. And the early church transcended the hatred and the differences by acceptance and welcoming and receiving people in to their fellowship, people who are committed to following Jesus, no matter what their background, no matter what their history. And perhaps Paul has in mind that once he was a persecutor of the church, but he was actually accepted and welcomed. A little hesitantly at first, as you would understand. They wanted to know that he really was following Jesus. And that's the uniqueness of the early church and that's the uniqueness of the church. It should be one of the things that marks us. The inclusiveness of people and welcoming the end as they seek to follow Jesus. They knew Jesus, the very Son of God, had accepted them in their brokenness and in their sin and had brought forgiveness and clarity and it was allowing them to grow through things. And so they accepted those for whom he had also died. The second thing is to appreciate the differences in each other. And sometimes we find that difficult because somebody doesn't do it the way I would do it or doesn't do this the way I or you would do it. 
And sadly, with all the language of acceptance and inclusivity that goes on in our society, it seems to me that some of those differences are actually used to create divisions and become quite vicious on occasions. And God didn't make us so uniquely different. I'm talking about the sheer diversity of even those gathered here today, whether you're talking about your country of origin, your age, your whatever. There's just this incredible diversity and ought to be celebrated, and I believe it is in this church. And not used to create divisions. God didn't make us different so we could be distant or divided. And a hatred for diversity doesn't reflect the love of the one who created it in the first place. And we get a glimpse in heaven. And I love these moments when the curtain is opened, as it were. And without getting too panicky about the book of Revelation and the Antichrist, it's more about Jesus and what he's up to when evil is seemingly prevailing on the planet. But he gives us this glimpse, Revelation 7 verse 9. And after this I looked and before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That, that this power, and it's Jesus, he's still the Lamb of God who, who brings us together, who heals the hurts, the divisions, the things that otherwise might have separated us. And I'm not suggesting for one moment that sometimes this isn't a complicated thing on how we engage in different ways. I'm just stating it in this instance as a value. The third thing is with affection. We, we affirm each other's worth by acceptance, by appreciating the unique differences in each other. But with affection, Romans 12 and verse 10, it says, love each other with genuine affection. Some translations would say brotherly love because the concept is as if they were your own family. Now, there may be family wars in some of your families, so just a good family, a healthy family. Love each other with genuine or family affection, brotherly affection, and take delight in honouring each other. In fact, literally the phrase could be translated, outdoing one another in showing honour. Like it's a competition. Now let's not get weird about that, but it's this whole thing of seeking proactively to be loving and honouring of each other. And loving with affection and preferring and honouring is important because they actually reflect our new nature in Christ. We are born again. The old is passing away. The new is beginning to grow through us in Christ. It's actually our new DNA is to be more like Jesus in the way we interact with people. And it's incredible just to read the Gospels the hundreds and hundreds of people that Jesus interacted with and the large number, I think, I forget it now, I think it's about 80 individuals that he engaged, that's recorded, obviously he engaged with more, but those are the recorded. And how diverse they were, but how inclusive he was. Oh yeah, he did challenge them about some things, about things they needed to turn around or repent of and all those things. It wasn't just a wishy-washy thing, but it was to inspire and cause them to aspire to be more like Him. It's our spiritual DNA. And Paul puts affection and honour together and they are different, but he connects them. But the reality is you can honour a person without feeling particularly affectionate towards them. And Paul doesn't want us to choose. Do I honour or is there affection? He just said, kind of do your best to do both. God is at work in all of us. And I think what he's saying to us, instead of pointing out the faults in people or reminding ourselves of what we don't like, he says, look for evidences of grace in that person's life. Because we all come broken in some way. We all come struggling with something. And in the journey of life, those things pop up at different times and in different ways. 
And he says, but look not for the negativity. And, and obviously there's some things that need to be challenged and need to be confronted, but it's in love. He says, but go looking for the evidence of grace in someone's life where God is at work and there's something, there's a softness in their heart towards that and God is working. And the, uh, the fourth thing about affirming people and welcoming them and giving them a sense of worth is with appreciation. And appreciation literally means to raise the value of something. If your home that you own is appreciating, it's going up in value. Maybe not right at this moment, but that's the essence of the word. And when you appreciate somebody and communicate it, you raise their value. Now you're not responsible for their self-esteem. Their, their identity is found first and foremost in Christ, but the whole thing of encouraging and supporting. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 12. Now, brothers and sisters, we ask you to appreciate those who work hard among you and who lead you in the Lord and teach you. I want you to know that appreciate those who work hard among you. When was the last time you, you just thanked somebody for what they're doing around the house? Every single Sunday in order for the service just here to flow, and I'm just talking about this one, there's close on 70 volunteers, and probably more when we include Kids Church, which we do. So about 80 people, the coffee shop, the, the teams that are controlling the, the knobs and the buttons that they love to fiddle with back there, and I'm going to be very nice to them because they can turn me off, and the ones up in the doing the live streaming and the cameras and the musicians and all the welcomers. It's incredible. And the thought of just thanking one of them for what they've done today to help you enjoy God's presence, hear God's word. The people in the serve teams that make such a difference. I love something that W.A. Ward said. He said, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. And I thought that was such a powerful statement. Because often we feel appreciation, gratitude, but just finding somebody to say, really appreciate or thank you for what you did today to contribute to whatever it is. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. And that gratitude is actually a spiritual force that empowers you and others to live bigger, to live bolder, to be more Faithful as we seek to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. The story of the 10 lepers that are healed. Luke's rendition in Luke 17. And one of them, so Jesus encounters these unclean. They isolated from society. They hang out together because alone they could be attacked in that and they're trying to eke out an existence. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they go, they see they're healed. And one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Let me just pause there. This man's in a sense, in every sense, a double outcast. He, in Jewish culture, he was an outcast simply because he was a Samaritan. There was a rivalry and an ancient history between those two peoples, the Samaritans and the Jews. But he's now also further isolated by being the leper. But now the leprosy is healed. And out of all of them, he comes back. And Jesus asked, where were the others? Weren't there 10? And... And then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Some translations say your faith has made you whole. And there's this difference between healed and made whole. And Jesus extends something to him because there was gratitude, there was appreciation. The word well or whole there means to save, to deliver, to make whole, to bring healing. And so we can help each other grow by affirming each other's worth in the ways that I've mentioned. We can 
help each other grow by encouraging each other's commitment to Christ first and foremost and then to engagement in a local church. We need others in our lives to encourage us. Paul, Paul, writing to Timothy, says that really following Jesus is a process where you're training yourself to be godly. Just listen to this in 1 Timothy 4, 7. And it says, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Now, I don't know if any of you, I know there are some of you, and this is not going to get personal, relax, have actually committed to some serious physical training. And you start off with the the noblest of ideals and then it's kind of, as winter comes, it's harder to get out of bed and all the rest of it, you know, the the thing. But if you're doing it with a group and you know they're waiting for you, you're suddenly slightly more motivated. Or if you get the text message, where are you? Oh, my alarm didn't go off, which means I really didn't set it. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? That just the added group actually moves you towards something. And training is always easier when you're doing it with others. In Romans chapter 1, verse 11 through 12, Paul says, I long to see you. He's seated the church at Rome, but he's never been there. And he knows there's this flourishing faith community right in Rome, under the, em- the, uh, under the emperor's nose. He says, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, that is, and that you and I can be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. There's just so much going on in the verse, but notice that in the connection, he's believing there's going to be encouragement in their faith. They'll stir each other up to believe greater, to believe for better things to believe for breakthrough. But it's also, he says, when I come together, there's going to be an impartation of a spiritual gift. And I think some of us read that and we go, oh yeah, the apostle walking in amongst these people, imparting spiritual gifts. It's actually not the way it reads in the original language. It's literally saying, when we together There is a manifestation of charisma, spiritual gifts. And the the word charisma comes from the the concept of an impartation of grace, charis. And he's saying when we get together, not only does our faith get stirred, but there is a manifestation of grace among us. It may come with the use of one of the spiritual gifts, but just in the moment, and it's like where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus is on there. And when Jesus is there, something supernatural happens. And I think sometimes when we gather, we're looking for something spectacular and we miss those moments of grace in the conversation where something's been imparted simply because you got together. You had a conversation. You prayed for someone. It's not the picture of the man of God coming in, the apostle and imparting. It's in the mutuality of the connection that something's taking place. Hebrews 10 verse 24 exhorts us and let us consider how we may spur one another to love and good deeds. Spur, stir each other up. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see this day approaching. And so we can help each other grow by affirming each other, our value in Christ as a human being, by um, encouraging each other's commitment. But I want to land on this one, by praying for each other. As I was preparing this, I, I got so challenged about how pathetic some of my prayers are. And some of you could go, well, we kind of suspected that. It's all right. I can live with it. And that some of the things that I pray that when reading some of the things that Paul prayed for other believers, I kind of think I need to change something here. And it's taken many years to get to that revelation, as you can well see. Be gentle. 
And you know how it is you read the Bible over and over again and you kind of come across a verse that I'm sure that wasn't there over the last 50 years that I've been reading the Bible. Where did that come from? Well, this is one of those, Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect and fully confident that you are fulfilling, fulfilling or that you are following the whole will of God. That just kind of left out of the page, went slap in a nice way. Just think of that. Epaphras, in the church at Colossae, part of the fellowship, a servant, in fact, Paul uses the word bond servant, bond slave there, which he only ever uses himself. This is the only other time he uses it of someone else apart from, I think, Timothy. And he says he sends you his greetings and he prays, always prays earnestly. That literally, it's the same word there, earnestly, that is used of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he agonised, making the choice, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He says this guy agonises. He puts some energy into prayer. And what he's praying is that God would make you strong. Be careful with the word perfect. It means to be complete and our completeness comes in Christ. Not perfect as we, we never get anything wrong. And fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I think I need, we all needed Epaphras in our life, don't we? In this conclusion to the letter, Paul lists 10 people who are investing in his walk with Jesus and encouraging him in his ministry. And I'm not going to go through all 10, but it's just quite astonishing. 10 people that Paul can name, they're involved in my life. They're a part of my walk with God. They are supportive. They're part of the cheer squad that I've got. And Epaphras prayed for followers of Jesus that they would know and do the will of God, just not half-heartedly, but the whole will of God would be outworked in their lives. And so when I ask the question, and I'm asking it honestly for all of us, who's praying for you? And who are you praying for? And along with Epaphras' prayer about the will of God, I've just lifted out a few. I'm not going to spend too much time on them except to read them. But Ephesians 3, Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus. He says, I pray that you will be able to feel and understand how long, wide, deep and high Christ's love really is and to experience this love for yourselves. But what if on Monday... We prayed that prayer of everybody that comes to mind in our family, in our friendships, in our points of connection, that they would experience and come to know in a deeper, wider way, Christ's love. Hebrews 13, 12. May God equip you with every good, sorry, may God equip you with everything good for doing His will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. What if that was the Tuesday prayer for those people who come to mind and come to life and we're praying it over them. You can pray all of them every day. I'm just trying to make this bite-sized and reasonable. Well, what if Wednesday, Ephesians 1, 17 was the prayer we prayed for each other. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that He may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can come to know Him that is Jesus better. We're praying that. God, give us revelation so we can get to know you and get to know Jesus better. And Lord, give us wisdom with that. What if that was the prayer? Whatever well, the next day we prayed... 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God 
and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. Lord, there's people out there and maybe you're one of them. They're doing it tough. May they know your love and and may you just communicate that, that hanging in there, hanging tough, patiently enduring. There's gonna be a reward. Lord, I just pray that into their lives. And what if the next day, Ephesians 3.16, I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your innermost being. Lord, they're people, they tired at the end of the week. They dealt, some people have dealt with terrible things. Others may be having a good week. But Lord, out of your glorious riches, would you just strengthen them by the power of the Holy Spirit? May they just feel something stir and awaken with them and they may be energised by the power of your Spirit and let strength come to them. Wow. So in helping each other grow, the question I asked, who's in your life and whose life are you in that you can affirm their worth, encourage them to greater commitment to Christ and how that's outworked and to pray for each other around prayers like this. And I've just taken a selection. I haven't gone through every single prayer that Paul or others in the New Testament prayed. And perhaps your next step is to go to the next step, lunch. Perhaps your next step is to follow Jesus in baptism. He set an example for us and he did it so we would do it. And I'm not going to get into the teaching or seeking out the baptism of the Holy Spirit or, or getting into a relationship through a life group or through a serve team. 